Um, so I'm going to introduce her. Primavera, you there? Are you there? Yes, hi everyone. Okay. Hi. In Paris. Hi. Yes, in Paris. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you, and then um, you have. Do you have a PowerPoint that you're going to put up after I do that? Yes, I have a PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ready? Okay. Primavera de Filippi is a legal scholar at Harvard University, director of research at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris, and an internet activist and artist exploring the intersections between law and technology. She specifically focuses on the legal and political implications of blockchain technology. Her artistic practice instantiates the key findings of her research in the physical world, creating blockchain-based life forms that evolve and reproduce themselves as people feed them with cryptocurrencies, it has been shown in various museums, galleries, and art fairs worldwide. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It. Yeah. Uh, should I go ahead? Yeah, you should go ahead. I think Great. you have to put the present uh, use presentation mode. Ah, uh, yes, sorry. Okay, is it good? Just so you know, people ask questions in the chat, which you can then answer at the end, or I'll read them to whatever you prefer, okay? Yeah, I'm happy to be interrupted uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay, great. Um, anyway, so yeah. So this is me, uh, I guess I can skip the introduction, but uh, I'm mostly, uh, uh, I'm an artist and a lawyer. Um, and uh, most of my artistic practice is about uh, using art uh, as a way of illustrating uh, the topic and the, the, the various uh, uh, issues that I address into my research and also using my research uh, as a way to, uh, explore new realms to to communicate with uh, through the art. Um, and I'm mostly like looking at uh, digital and like digital copyright and uh, blockchain. And so most of my work is uh, is surrounding this. Um, and so I, I've been very involved as well with like the Creative Commons with the Open Knowledge Foundation, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation. Uh, and uh, I guess as a, as a as a consequence of this, I'm uh, I'm very aligned with the idea of uh, uh, trying to explore ways in which we can uh, kind of promote uh, a more open and uh, sharing economy in the digital world, uh, especially uh, as a um, as a way to uh, bypass some of the standard restrictions of uh, our copyright law. Uh, to the extent that uh, there is, of course, a lot of value in uh, uh, incentivizing creators, but also it is important to make sure that uh, the, um, the constraint and the, and the restriction imposed by copyright do not uh, excessively impede upon the creative process. And um, um, so just as a little uh, copyright 101. <laughs> Uh, so intellectual property, which is uh, essentially a way to realign the property of uh, the general abstract artwork, the, the, the work of authorship, which is by its intrinsic nature, something that is both non-rival and non-scarce uh, because it is essential information. It can be freely reproduced and uh, everyone can benefit from a particular artwork without necessarily uh, preventing authors from also benefiting from it. So it, it, there is no rivalry in consumption. Uh, but then the physical medium where most of the artworks were uh, recorded until the advent of the internet and the digital world uh, is a physical medium, which is both rival and scarce. And so copyright introduced artificial scarcity on the work of art uh, in, and in some way managed to realign the artworks with the properties of the, uh, of the physical medium. So by creating this kind of artificial scarcity in information goods, we can now trade uh, IP, intellectual property, in the same way as we're trading a physical object. 
Uh, now, when we enter into the digital world, then uh, again, now we have again a discrepancy in the sense that we have the artwork, which is subject to artificial scarcity, meaning uh, intellectual property. And then we have the digital medium, which is inherently non-rival and non-scarce. So as we integrate uh, a copyrighted work into a digital file, again, there is a discrepancy because the file can be freely reproduced at almost no cost, and there is no rivalry in consumption, but the artwork is because of copyright. And then what's very interesting is that now with blockchain technology, there is these newfound possibilities of creating a new type of scarcity in digital goods, which is not artificial scarcity, which is not created because of legal means, but which is actually digital or technical scarcity, which is incorporated via technical means through the use of blockchain technology. So blockchain technology for the, of perhaps the first time in history, enable uh, to create some kind of technical scarcity on digital information. And so why it is very uh, interesting and revolutionary is that it enables new monetization models for digital artists, uh, which is no longer based on the commercialization of their IP through the licensing of copyright, but which is actually enabling them for the first time in history to sell digital copies of their works, right? Because what they're selling is not, is not the copyright in the work, but is rather the unique and authentic copy of their digital works, just in the same way as uh, an author can sell a book and that does not entail at all the transfer or the licensing of the copyright in the book, but just the physical copy of the book. And so now we can transpose this into the, the digital realm. And so this enable a whole new uh, wave of uh, uh, what we call crypto art, um, which defines itself as this kind of blockchain art. And um, we need to kind of, think when we're when we're talking about crypto art like what are we really referring to and oftentimes when we're uh, talking of crypto art we're we're really talking of digital paintings to the digital artworks uh, which are using the blockchain as a transaction layer which are recorded on a blockchain tokenized as an nft and then sold on the blockchain um, but in some way it's almost like saying that if I'm, a, if I'm a physical painter, if I create a canvas and uh, I sell my paintings on eBay, that doesn't, that doesn't make me a digital artist. That makes me a physical artist that uses the digital medium only for selling my artworks. And so in the same way, uh, many of those NFT uh, are not necessarily blockchain artworks, but are just like digital artworks that are being sold using the blockchain as the transaction layer. And so I want to present an example of what I consider to be closer to be actual blockchain art, which uh, where the difference is a blockchain artist is using the, the blockchain as the medium of expression and not just as a way of selling. Uh, so it's the same. If we make an analogy, it will be the same as talking about Net art, net art is actually using the internet as the medium of expression, as opposed to any, any artist selling stuff on eBay or on Amazon or on any digital platform. So the Plantoid is a project that uh, uh, I started back in 2014, uh, which has had many iterations since then. Uh, and the idea is to leverage the potentiality of blockchain technologies, of DAOs, of smart contracts, in order to create what I call a blockchain-based life form, uh, which, which instantiate itself in the form of this kind of uh, Android version of a plant, so a plantoid. And so the properties of a blockchain-based life form is that it is autonomous in the sense that uh, it does not depend on any single party for its, uh, for its existence. Uh, it is self-sufficient because it can collect the resources that it needs in order to sustain itself. 
And then like any other life form, it is also capable of reproducing itself. And so if we think about plants, uh, a large majority of plants are actually not capable of reproducing themselves on, on their own. And they rely on the help of uh, third parties, bees or butterflies, in order to help them in the pollination process, right? <coughs> Meaning that those, those third parties are actually contributing to the process of reproduction by taking pollen and spreading it around to other type of, uh, uh, of plants. And then, so a plantoid does not rely on the pollinization process, but rather on the capitalization process. And uh, they also rely on third parties. They cannot reproduce themselves on their own, uh, but they require the help of humans in this case to uh, collect capital for them and to donate this capital in order to facilitate the reproduction process. And so a plant is essentially uh, a mechanical sculpture. It's, uh, it's something that exists in the physical world, uh, but it also has a particular soul or a spirit, which is instantiated as a smart contract uh, on the Ethereum blockchain or on any other type of blockchain. And those two components, the body and the spirit, interact with one another in order to enable the plant to reproduce itself. So the process of reproduction is made of three fundamental phases. The first one is the capitalization phase, phase which is when the plant is collecting cryptocurrencies in order to sustain its uh, reproduction process. And so every plant has a uh, as a as a wallet as an account uh, is a smart contract on on a blockchain. So, for instance, on Ethereum, and then uh, anyone that actually wants to support the reproduction of the plantoid can send funds to the plantoid. Can send funds directly to the smart contract uh, that is that is the spirit of the plantoid. And then the plantoid has like a variety of sensors. Uh, and so you can interact with the plantoid. And uh, uh, whenever you send money, whenever you send the, crypto, the cryptocurrency, it activates. It's kind of like a jukebox, if you like. So you have to insert funds, and then this brings the plantoids to life. And then you can interact with it by interacting with the various sensors, some of which are like a luminosity sensor or vibration sensor, movement sensors. There's a variety of possible sensors. And then the data collected through the sensors is fed into this uh, generative uh, algorithm that creates an art piece out of it. Uh, the art piece can be a graphical uh, image. It can be a musical piece. Uh, and uh, depending on what you do with the sensor, the resulting artwork will be slightly different. And then, and then at the end of the period of activation, then uh, an NFT is created with the art piece that has been generated by those who sent cryptocurrencies to the smart contract. And uh, uh, they now have been awarded an NFT, which represents a seed of the plantoid. And uh, of course, the more funds have been donated, uh, the longer is the period of activation, and therefore, ideally, the better is the outcome of the art piece that has been generated. And so those seeds now are kind of the seed of a plant. They can travel around, they can be disseminated. And uh, every time they are disseminated, in the case of an NFT, it is when they are being sold on the secondary market. And then every time there is a sale, 10% of the resale price is taken and transferred back to the smart contract of the plantoid. And so, by the humans, by spreading around the seeds of the plantoid, by selling those NFTs, are contributing to the funding of the plantoid by driving back capital into the, into the smart contract. And then once a particular threshold is reached, once the plantoid has enough funds in order to reproduce itself, 
uh, then is the time of activating the second phase of reproduction, which is the mating phase. And that is where the plant body is trying to find a mate, a human, that can help it reproduce itself. And so the way it works is that uh, the, the, the achievement of the threshold uh, open up a call for proposition. Basically, people can submit proposals to the smart contract in the traditional way in which DAOs operate. Uh, so you can submit a proposal with the uh, Ethereum address of the person submitting as the ID, and then a link to the proposal about how they envision to create the next version of the plant art. And then now all the people that have received an NFT or the people that have acquired it on the secondary market can now vote for the propositions that they like the most. And so it's like one NFT, one vote, um, in order to then select which one will be the, the, the winning proposition. And this is what then triggers the third phase of reproduction, which is the hiring phase. And this is where the plantoid will transfer the funds to the new artist uh, that will then be commissioned or hired by the plantoid in order to create a new copy of itself. And so uh, the way it works is, of course, that uh, so the smart contract is automated. So the funds are held uh, only and exclusively by the Ethereum smart contract. Uh, but in order for those funds to be delivered to the selected winner, it needs to be approved by the current artist, by the artists of the particular plantoid, uh, just in order to avoid some kind of like takeovers. Uh, where people might be diverting funds in a place that is actually not acceptable. <coughs> so the artist cannot choose where the money goes, but once the smart contract has selected a particular beneficiary, the artist is the one that will unlock this transaction. And so basically, the artist has a veto power, but not a decision-making power. And so here you can see the genealogical tree of the plantoid species. Um, the, the important thing to, to know is also that every, every plantoid has a particular genetic code, uh, meaning like some requirement that needs to be then implemented by all the descendants of that particular branch of the plantoid. So the plantoid number one, the Genesis plantoid, uh, the requirement was that every plantoid needs to be made out of chain because it is a blockchain-based life form and uh, uh, that it is released under Creative Commons so that anyone can freely uh, remix the plantoid with no, without asking for authorization. And then all the subsequent plantoids, every time an artist is creating a new one, uh, they, can, they have to respect all the previous criteria, uh, but they can add also new genes into the genetic code. And so, for instance, if you look at uh, plantoid number three, uh, plantoid number three introduced the wings, uh, meaning that all the, all the subsequent plantoids also have to come with wings. Um, plantoid number two introduced like uh, some kind of like rainbow type of lightning uh, when it is fed. And so then the next plantoids also have to implement the same function. So this creates some kind of like specialization or speciation where uh, uh, people choose to fund the plantoids that they like the most. And that's going to enact a reproduction of those genes of those plantoids. And so this creates this kind of dar digital Darwinism or evolutionary algorithm where the plantoids that have the traits that are the most appealing will be more likely to reproduce themselves whereas those that are actually not very appreciated will simply fade uh, into extinction. Um, another important element is the pyramid scheme because after all, it is a blockchain art project. And so uh, it wouldn't exist without a proper pyramid scheme. And, uh, and the idea here is that every time the plant would reproduce itself, it is sending uh, a percentage of the funds back to the parent plantoid to the plant that actually generated it, but also 10% goes to the artist. So this creates some kind of uh, incentive 
um, in order to create a plant oil that will be the most beautiful, the most appealing, the most attractive, the most likely to reproduce itself because every time it's reproducing itself and every time the descendants are reproducing themselves, then the artists that, are, that created this plantoid will actually benefit. And so this kind of like change the, um, the system from like the traditional copyright in which the artist has an incentive to preclude authors from reproducing or remixing the work. Whereas here, the most remix and the most reproduction, uh, the more profits are made by the artist. And then another interesting thing that happens is that this kind of like flips copyright on its head uh, because indeed copyright usually is based on this notion of scarcity and exclusivity, meaning that artists are precluding access to their work because they need to monetize access, monetize reproduction, monetize like every possible interaction that is done with the work. Whereas in this model, artists have the highest incentive to maximize the visibility, the dissemination uh, of the work because that means that they will have more likely to be funded. And then again, to maximize the creation of remixes because that's also what will provide a higher amount of royalties. But perhaps most importantly, it also um, enable perhaps for the first time in history uh, to fund not the art work, not the artist, Meaning that usually in the, in the pre-blockchain world, uh, if there is an artwork that I like, I'm going to fund the artist. And I'm going to hope that the artist will continue to create works that I like. Uh, whereas now, I can now fund directly the art piece itself. And then it is the art piece with its own funds that will select or elect who is the artist that is entitled uh, to create a new copy of itself. And it doesn't always need to be the same artist. In fact, this is more important for the artwork to be more evolving and variegated that many artists are involved into the reproduction of this. And so just to conclude, um, this is for me like one very interesting instance of this thing that uh, uh, what what I define to be perhaps a new type of artistic movement or artistic community that is around the notion of protocolism, where uh, the artist, the author, is not necessarily the one that always instantiates the protocol, but the artist is the one that actually come up with the protocol. And so in the case of the plantoid, the plantoid project, the artwork is not just the physical instance, but it's also the concept of this blockchain-based life form that reproduces itself. And so every time the plant does reproduce, whether I am the artist that is making the, the new instance or some other artist is making the new instance, somehow every single one of those instances, nonetheless, they, they represent also my, my work. Uh, and so there's this kind of weird collaborative or collective artwork that is happening in which um, in some way people that are creating new, new plantoids are actually also working to instantiate my work. Uh, and so of course the, the artist needs to be recognized for its craftsmanship and for the creation of the individual uh, plantoids. But at the same time, because they are instantiating the protocol, which I am the artist for, uh, they are also helping me reproduce my work. Uh, and so again, it is no longer about, reproduction is no longer a problem, a violation of copyright. It is actually a way to produce new works because every new work is different. And uh, whether I've made it or other people have made it, it is just the reproduction and the new instantiation of the general, um, of the general artist. Um, so yeah, those are just examples, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to respond to an, any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Primavera. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to congratulate because I, I don't think that there are many artists, many people who have been able to <clears throat> bridge art, software, and governance, and that's uh, uh, something new, at least for me, and uh, and also bridging the digital and the physical uh, world. Um, one one question 
very practical question. Maybe I didn't pay attention, but <clears throat> your the artworks that you're talking about, uh, are they just images of artworks or are they physical objects? Can they be a sculpture, uh, a piece of music? So the the artworks that are generated by the planter, do you mean? Yes. Yeah, so um, basically whatever a planter can generate uh, and uh, then can be introduced into an NFT. So it has to be digital. It doesn't need to be graphical. Uh, in fact, most of the planters today are doing musical thing, uh, but it needs to be something that is immaterial uh, because otherwise you cannot really make it into an NFT. Right? So it, it can be video, it can be audio, it can be just like a static image, uh, but it cannot be a sculpture because, I mean, that would require a very complicated uh, planter that makes an actual physical item, which is possible, but then the NFT will be much more, will be not necessarily associated with that piece, right? So there is no guarantee that by selling the NFT, you are selling the piece. Uh, so inherently the NFT, because it exists, the seed exists on the blockchain. So it has to be a digital representation. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I understand that, that you're also trying to help the artist with the, with the pyramid uh, uh, scheme. Uh, and I also understand uh, uh, why you think it's good that, that the copyright is no longer the goal. It's almost the obstacle. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> I mean, it looks like <clears throat> if you just add a little bit of uh, artificial intelligence to this system, you can get rid of the artist. <clears throat> the artist could be some kind of doll E that generates uh, uh, artworks. Am I right? Yeah, so uh, I think there's a very important distinction to me. Maybe I didn't answer the first question correctly. So the plantoids, uh, those actual things here, those are all physical pieces. Those are all sculptures. Those are like uh, like very tangible, very heavy uh, metallic pieces. Okay, so the 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 plantoid instance is always and exclusively a physical sculpture. Now, what the plantoid generate the seeds, uh, the NFTs are inherently digital. So when you say you can. You can eliminate the artist. You cannot eliminate the artist that will create the physical plantoid. What you can do, but that's already the case. It's like the so when I when I send funds to the plantoid, the plantoid activate itself. I can now touch it. I can I can I can interact with it, and then as I interact with it, data is being collected. This data is the seeds for a algorithm it can be like a generative art algorithm whether or not we want to call it ai or it can be an actual like one of those new large model uh like dali or like whatever musical music like prompting so it can also the the data can become seeds for a prompt that we can send to one of those it can be a poetry i can use chat gp3 or whatever but this is the so there is, on the one hand, the planter as an art piece, and then there is the artwork that is created through the interaction with the plantoid. And that, that second type of artwork is, is computer generated. Uh, it can be AI generated, or it can be just like a more simple type of generative algorithm. But the plantoid itself cannot be done without an artist, unless we have like, unless we have some very sophisticated robot and AI that managed to create new sculptures. Okay, good. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, so, oh, one second, I see from um, Therese. She, uh, got the speaker before you, she says, uh, do you have images of the impact of the evolution of the plantoids in the form of the NFTs? Uh, 
Do you have image of the impact? I don't understand what's the impact of the evolution of the plantoid. I think you could ask directly, Therese, if you want, since you're on the panel. So the uh, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating presentation. And we're looking at actual objects right now. Um, images of objects uh, and uh, as as other artists uh, respond uh, I mean are they are they vision as they as they respond in the blockchain to the individual uh, images in the NFT, form uh, how are they are you showing uh like these sculptural forms uh are you showing the interaction of other artists responding to those forms or in impacting those forms because i got the sense from your uh that there was some kind of morphing of the forms through the blockchain. So I, maybe I mis mis uh, mis explained. Uh, so the blockchain the blockchain is just like the funding mechanism and the tracking mechanism. Uh, this is like this is the there is currently thirteen plantoids in the world. Uh, the 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 thirteen one is currently in the making. So I don't have a picture yet. But um, basically, this is this is the example of how they evolve. So you can see how the plant number one, plant number one was actually this one. You can find the actual picture. Uh, yeah, the plant number one was the one like at the bottom left. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very simple creature. And uh, this is pretty much the one that has reproduced itself the most because it was the first one. And then uh, and then you can see how different different plants that come with different traits, right? Um, so again, plantoid two had this kind of like bulb, like light bulb that will create like rainbows. And, uh, and so plantoid four also introduced that. And then plantoid three started having wings. And so all the following one also have wings. Uh, Plantoid five started introducing this movement. And so like when you feed it, it starts like moving the head like this. Uh, and so Plantoid nine, which is stemming from it also has the same type of movement. And then Plantoid three uh, also reproduce itself into Plantoid 11, 10 and 12, uh, which all have wings. And then each one of them also have their own criteria so whenever they will reproduce they also will have to adopt this particular genetic code right so those are the physical art piece that reproduce itself and then there is the nft so the nft i don't have picture because the nft are pretty much all uh, musical so it's uh all the plant that are actually so the, the nft generating plant is very recent um and um if i just started adding the nft system uh when there is the nft hype that came about uh because i was like okay it's time to upgrade the plantoid but uh so right now it's music so there are like uh, a variety so uh, plantoid uh 10 11 and 12 which i have the pictures here they went to burning man uh like uh, in the desert of festival and so at burning man at the time there was no internet because starlink wasn't there yet and so uh, there was no connectivity, and so I had to find something different in order to create this kind of interaction. Uh, and so they they all were like those musical art pieces, uh, which are also illustrating the concept of distributed consensus. And the idea is that you will come next to those plantoids, and uh, a lot of sensor, like hundreds of sensor over the three pieces. And uh, and as you get closer, or as you touch them, or as the wind blows. Uh, it will activate the sensors and it will create or modify 
the music that was uh, constantly being fed to this generative algorithm. And so people eventually uh, will start jamming and starting to explore uh, how to jam together. And so at the beginning, it will kind of be like this cacophony, which is like noise. Uh, but then after a few minutes, people start understanding the tempo and like kind of like coalescing around a particular type of melody and the cacophony slowly evolve into an actual nicer musical piece. Uh, and so the idea was to illustrate as well, like distributed consensus where there is no centralized chef d'orchestre that is dictating people what to do, but there is this kind of like, because we'll all have a, a particular communality into what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. Uh, people just find from like distributed consensus, they find each other. So that was the beginning of those musical instruments, presented as musical tools. And then, uh, and so now the NFTs that they generate are also musical pieces that you can play the plantoid uh, by sending funds to it. And then it activates it and it starts making music, which can be just like environmental music. And then you can intervene by, by touching or affecting the sensors. Okay, so they... Um... The plantoids in their physical form and then in their musical compositions, all uh, they're physical and they have physical interactions. And then yes. they become NFTs um, from the physical interaction. They don't become NFTs. The NFTs, the plantoid never become an NFT. Okay. The plantoid generates NFT as part of its seeds. The seed of the plantoid is an NFT, which then will feed back uh, cryptocurrencies to the plantoid in order to help the plantoid to reproduce itself. Uh, who made the plantoids uh, that you brought to Burning Man? Uh, I mean, we were... Uh, we were a team. <laughs> uh, they are very big. They are like uh, six meter tall. Uh, so I mean, I I I I kind of steer up the, the the project, but uh, we were about like seven seven people working on the oh. on this project. So how many plantoids there are now in the world? Uh, so as I said, uh, there is currently twelve which are finalized, and uh, uh, I'm currently working on the thirteenth. <laughs> Are there any yes. other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. And thank you for um, getting up in the middle of the night or no worries. To, uh, to speak to us. We really thank appreciate you, it. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Okay, and thank you to, to everybody for joining us and um, look forward to um, some seeing you at some future either in person or zoom lasers okay thank you tammy and piero okay thank you everybody welcome thank you bye bye hey. thank bye you. thank you gay primavera bye thank you everyone. bye bye